Welcome to Screen Therapy. I'm your host, Jason Schurz. In October of 2018, I found myself in the hospital, sitting across from a psychiatrist, who was telling me that I was bipolar. I was released with a bunch of medication and laid on the couch for about a week. I had my iTunes library on shuffle, trying to shake the hornet's nest from my head. Ever since I was a kid, I've been using music for therapy and as a way to escape. Punk rock and mental health have always been connected. This podcast looks at that connection through the lens of different guests. This is Screen Therapy. One day I was researching for this podcast and the upcoming Screen Therapy book when I came across a blog post called Punk Rock Doesn't Give a Shit About Your Inner Critic. It was written by a therapist named Simon Forsyth, who runs Nozomi Counseling in Dublin, Ireland. The blog post talked about how Simon uses a punk attitude to provide therapy to his clients. He explained how therapy itself is an act of rebellion. When we talked, Simon brought along a piece of paper with the word punk in the middle. He had written a bunch of other words around it. They included revolution, self-worth, and belonging. Simon's a huge Minor Threat fan, joined the club, and other bands like Bikini Kill and Bad Brains opened his eyes to a whole new facet of punk rock, one where resistance, rebellion, and reclamation replaced the nihilism of some of the original punk bands. Simon says punk challenges you to say no. It breeds meaningful relationships, critical anger, authentic living, and self-confidence. It challenges you to be visible and unashamed. Simon came out as a gay man a year after he discovered punk rock. Before that, he was afraid to tread outside what everyone around him said was the right way to be. Coming out gave him the same liberty he felt from punk rock. In his private practice, Simon talks to his clients about self-censorship, about how internalized messages lead to self-criticism. Simon works with his clients to channel their desire to live authentically, on their own terms. As Minor Threat said, I'm Simon Forsyth, I'm 37, um, from Dublin in Ireland. I have been into punk since I was about 17. In terms of my development as a human being, I'm going to say, I was going to say a person, but the human being is more apt. Um, punk is important because what I just did before we started talking was I did something that I do in my counselling. One of the things I'm really into is about writing as therapy. I just did a diagram, which I'm not going to go through forensically with you by any means. I put the word punk in the middle of the page, and I've just written all the words that came to my mind around punk. And the things that I've underlined really appealed to me when I was getting into punk for the first time, which were the fact that it felt very transgressive, it had a lot of self-belief, it was very rebellious, unashamed, unapologetic, very free, authentic, confident, and a real sense of kind of liberty. And I've linked that to a sense of unity. And I think that means the unity in yourself by just allowing yourself to kind of be these things. Because I know for me anyway, one of the reasons that punk was so life-changing actually was it gave me that alternative view to be things that I wasn't, because I definitely wasn't at the time. When I got into punk, I was still in the closet. I hadn't come out. I was ashamed of myself in a lot of ways. I, I definitely wasn't authentic in the way I wanted to be because I felt like I couldn't. Um, I had very low self-confidence, didn't have much self-belief. I was also very by the book and kind of in line with my upbringing as a kid. Fabulous parents and everything, but very cautious kind of people. And that was the environment. So for me, punk represented that just that sense of possibility around doing things without even thinking, without anxiety, without being scared, just fearless, unashamed, and the power of that, something I really aspired to. And I think that's really grown since I got into punk then, got counselling when I was 18, 19, late 20s, early 30s, I, I started my training. And all of this stuff has been part of my journey, that kind of stuff to work out how to be yourself, to be you, to be authentic about being you, and what you need to stand up against to do that. 
the follow through. And that's really what I think it really still informs in the back of my mind when I'm working with clients, even like when I see a client who's maybe been holding something back for a long time, especially if it's something like anger, you know, because there's a lot of people feel like things like anger are kind of a bit scary and, you know, are kind of frowned upon. But of course, they're just emotions and they are perfectly valid and lots of time it's really important to get angry if you've had something you should be angry about so many of us kind of keep that under wraps so when I see a client kind of start to get angry or start to channel that kind of resistance against that kind of voice that says you know keep that to yourself or it'd be better for everyone if you didn't say anything or not cause a scene like that's what I feel listening to a client I feel my punk energy going to rise up in the session even if I don't ever name it to say to them like you're being punk I'm feeling that kind of energy of resistance and rebellion I've got my fist here you know it kind of feels like a fight so taking the ethos of punk rock and applying it to your life going forward Exactly. Absolutely. One of the words I have down here is values. And I think it is all of these things that are written, they feel like values, like life values that are very important to me in, in some form or another. Another one that jumps out at me is like inclusive, because I think for me, one of the ways I would work like with myself and other people is that we're like, we all contain so many different facets of ourselves and what I like about punk as well is that even though it's to an outsider to the punk scene, I know some people will look at a bunch of punk shenanigans and they'd say you know those people are stupid or they're just being zany or whatever we know there's so much more to that like it's like punk is really intelligent but it knows how to kind of dress it up and it can be fun as well and i like that kind of duality the kind of simultaneous nature because we all embody that too it's just to be yourself like you have to get in touch with all those bits and pieces that make up who you are and like allow them to communicate and integrate and have a party (laughs) tell me about your introduction to the punk scene So my introduction to the punk scene was through a book, which is really telling because I love reading and the academic side of things. A co-worker of my father's, when I was 17, he gave me a lend of a book about the New York Dolls. And I was in this kind of little college. I didn't really know who I was, to be honest with you, because I had a shit time in school, but I wasn't in university yet. So I didn't feel fully free. I was in this kind of like midway year and I was kind of trying to work out who I was. And I had this book about these guys called the New York Dolls. I was reading about them. Like, I still remember sitting in the little coffee break room in that place. And I can only imagine, like, all these people kind of chatting around me. And here's this kind of, like, geeky kid in the corner reading this, like, very pink, very kind of colorful covered book about these guys called the New York Dolls. And I was reading about them kind of going, I fucking love this. It's scuzzy, sleazy and dangerous. And I'd never heard any of their music even at that point. But I was reading this book. I went into the city center. I bought their debut album. And even now, when I listen to it now, like it's it's not really, it's a lot more melodic than a lot of the punk that I would really listen to these days or that I went afterwards, but it has that attitude. And I think that's really what hooked me was the attitude. It was just kind of like, again, that sense of just be yourself. When I learned a bit more about them, I guess there was that sense of they were outsiders, you know, and they were into the Stooges who I then got into and like they were kind of like people were looking at them saying, you fucking weirdos, you're into the Stooges. They were kind of drawing on all these strands of music but they were kind of reviled. You know, I mean, a lot of people like really thought they were disgusting. And and I just loved that idea of just like, fuck you, we can just do this. So then after that, the New York Dolls got into the Ramones, Iggy Pop, the Stooges. Mostly at the beginning, for me, it was the that kind of 70s American punk. I got into the Clash and the Damned and not so much the Sex Pistols, but the English stuff never really appealed to me in the same way because it felt kind of more familiar because like I knew the landscape that they were talking about like I grew up in the 80s and going on about Thatcher the royal family you know that felt familiar to me whereas the American stuff felt very exotic almost like in New York like symbolizing the sense of huge possibility and to me that's really exciting and uh, liberating. So you came out around the same time that you discovered punk and I'm wondering how punk rock informed you as a gay man and how being a gay man informed you in punk rock there seems like there's a correlation there from what you've told me yeah definitely yeah so I got into punk about a year before I came out and everything that punk symbolized it gave me that courage I think the punk stuff looking back I think was really important in that yeah it's like kind of supportive kind of way to kind of like show like you know I remember like listening to the Ramones and I'd be looking at like Joey Ramon, I'd be like, this guy is so freaky. He was gangly, he was tall, he was different looking. The way he sang was kind of odd. 
and I remember just listening to him and, and then Iggy as well and kind of going like wow like these guys they're just themselves and it's cool I didn't have that I really was very I was painfully aware of the fact that I, I wasn't myself and I'd been aware for years that I wasn't myself but then brick by brick it kind of gave me that sense of by osmosis I was like sucking up that idea of other people who were themselves again unapologetic about us just the permission to be yourself all of that gave me the courage to eventually then come out and then I think like you said then there was that flip side how being a gay man influenced my identity then with punk because to me it felt kind of almost unusual I felt like a little bit of a freak in the gay scene at the time because I didn't know many other gay people that were into music in the way I was like I'm obsessed with music and it's not just punk like it's so many genres that's the inclusivity for me like music is just important to me full stop and punk is one of one facet of that but I didn't really know any other gay people at that time that were sharing this is like the internet wasn't such a big thing at that point so I felt quite alone in that way but at the same time that felt important for me like from an identity point of view because that made me feel even more like unique I felt kind of like I'm going to be the gay guy who is like this musical encyclopedia and is into punk. And you mentioned being introverted as far as punk community goes. I'm assuming that means you didn't go to too many shows and it almost feels like you were studying it. You were a student of mm. punk rock. Yeah, yeah. It's very uh, observant of you for sure. For me, music was such a refuge and I did study it because music was my, it was actually, well, certainly when I was a teen, in the closet music was a coping mechanism like it was my refuge from fear and from kind of sadness but it gave me hope and that sense of community so like I attended a lot of shows when I was like 18 19 but not so much punk shows because I think most of the punk I was really into at that time and still today it's the 70s 80s not so much even the 90s stuff and beyond so I'm probably like terribly out of touch with what the punk scene looks like today all my big hitters they're long gone or been around for a long time I suppose for some people I'm sure it probably seems bizarre but like I would be lying in my bed with my headphones on listening to Raw Power by the Stooges or listening to Bikini Kill or whatever listening like really listening when I even go to a gig now I'm like one of those people watching and listening I'm not jumping up and down as much <laughs> I'm not like kind of slam dancing or whatever <laughs> like I'm, I'm there i'm switched on and paying attention and maybe that's how i did study i might put it this way that i was studying i suppose what these people were doing and what they were putting out into the world in order for me to kind of assimilate that stuff for myself like the messages i suppose because it's not just about the music and what it sounds like it's the message of resistance or the fight or the being gonzo or being feminist or whatever it is I just soaked it up like a sponge. And it was more about my inner acceptance, I suppose, self-acceptance and then integration of those different parts of me. And then they kind of came out of my everyday life, not so much even by being a punk overtly, but just by being a punk, by being cool with myself and being happy as who I was and walking around with my head held high. Like that was the most punk thing I could ever do was just by just being myself uh, in my everyday life and being being happy with that. I read the blog on your counseling website and you talked a lot about clients coming in and being stuck in certain ways with their own opinion of themselves, where they're at in their lives. And you applied punk rock ethos or morals to that experience being a counselor. People believe that they should be a certain way, act a certain way. They have these internal messages about themselves and they're very self-critical they think that there's acceptable and unacceptable behavior and self-censoring and these sorts of things. I mean, I would go one step further maybe and say self-stigmatizing as well. Mm -hmm. I found that really interesting that you could apply the punk rock ethos to that uh, part of your practice. Can you tell me more about that? For sure. Yeah. Something else, like aside from the blog post I've been working on is like this kind of zine type thing that I called resist, rebel, reclaim. To me, it's like a punk rock manifesto for self-esteem depending on the person's background, but I think we all do it to some extent or other. We grow up in this social kind of environment where naturally as a kid or a teenager, we learn this idea of what's acceptable behavior, what's unacceptable behavior, what we should show to the world, what we shouldn't show to the world, or sometimes even to ourselves, like the stuff that we kind of consciously or unconsciously put in like a storeroom and, and just kind of allow to sit there. And to me, there's a real sadness about that because there's often so much stuff that in there 
it isn't stuff to be ashamed of, but it's sometimes that idea that we have of this isn't going to be looked on well by other people. It's going to be judged. It's going to be laughed at, ridiculed, then I'll feel humiliated or rejected. And it just leads to this horrible kind of schism, I think, between the things that we feel we can be versus the things that we are. And to me, it's all about unity then, like how to kind of bring them together. And I think for me, they're just the punk ethos of revolution, of rebellion, of resistance, of, and to me, reclaiming them as well. It doesn't disappear completely. Like it's there, this internal attic or garage or something. Maybe you have to find the key to unlock it a little bit. And then maybe, maybe step by step, you can start taking boxes out from it and unpacking the stuff that's there and even experimenting to say, well, maybe I could be like a little bit more assertive with people in my work or something. Because that's something, that's an everyday example. Like if I work with people who have low self-esteem, very often that will manifest in like kind of people pleasing activity, that kind of sense of, well, like who am I to say no to this person? Because deep down, I kind of feel like I'm not really that worthy. So if someone asks me to stay late at work, I got to say yes, because what else would I do? And it becomes that very unhelpful pattern of behavior that really it keeps that person in like a really narrow box, like not even for themselves, but like then other people see them that way as well. And then it's hard to kind of break out of that. Then it gets really tight. And that sense of if I transgress this norm now, people will reject me, people won't like me, I'll be put out on my own. All the stuff which is fear-based. Punk rock is very fearless. It's very rare that I think someone would, who's into punk would say, oh, and I like punk because it's it sits in the corner and unconfident. Like to me, that's the opposite of what punk embodies. That's where I'm coming from with the punk stuff. It's kind of like giving a framework almost. It doesn't matter that it, to me that it's not from a psychological world or whatever. It's still channeling that energy of you can actually stand up for yourself. It, to me, there's something about permission there. It's kind of saying, we've done it. It's supportive. It's encouraging. It's saying, you know, you can stand up for yourself if you maybe get in touch with that so the side of you that's telling you why you shouldn't. If you can kind of dispute that a little bit or stand up to that internally a little bit first, then with some kind of help and some encouragement, you might then be able to kind of even slowly manifest that in the outside world. And then people might get scared as well because they start standing up for themselves. You know, then other people don't like that. And other people then kind of treat them differently or someone will say, oh, you've changed, you know, and then there's almost that threat of going back in. And I think it's, uh, again, with that punk point of view, it'd be like saying, don't let them convince you that you shouldn't keep on trying. You need to try and stay firm. You're actually trying to create something here that's for you, like a better version of your reality where you can be more confident you can be more assertive whatever kind of allow that to grow organically yeah I think it's a beautiful gift that someone can give themselves what do you think it is that makes people make that leap of faith whether it's punk rock or a religious cult <laughs> I don't know <laughs> maybe there's depend on the person but I think maybe sometimes I think people will be aware of whether they are really conscious of it or not I think people will often be aware deep down that something maybe doesn't feel right to them. If someone feels that they don't belong, that might be really ingrained. But on the other hand, like we are human beings and like we're kind of almost programmed actually to be social beings, to belong in some form or another and to connect to other people. I get that image in my head that almost like this very faint kind of call, something almost very deep down kind of maybe calling out and kind of saying like, maybe this doesn't have to be that way. And maybe there is something different for you even if it's very, very faint. And I kind of feel like that's what I would see with a certain type of client in particular, where like even the fact that they've got in touch with someone to come to talk to a counsellor, that something in them is open to change, even if change is terrifying. And you know, not everyone is ready for it. Like someone may come for counselling for maybe two or three sessions and then something in them will get scared and intimidated by the idea because change is hard and taking that leap of faith can be really scary. But I think if there is enough of that kind of perseverance and that call, then can get stronger to say, you know what, maybe I do deserve it. I think a lot of people have that sense of, I don't deserve to be happy. I don't deserve to belong. I don't deserve to feel worthy in myself. They're all shit things to feel that are true. Most of the time, they're not true, actually. But through experiences, through whether it's bullying or abuse or whatever it is, you know, people very often have that sense of, this is what I get. So I don't know, to wind back to your question, I think maybe there is hopefully 
there's just something quite deep down that maybe wants to grab onto a sense of hope or optimism that change can be possible, even if it's not easy. And maybe again, something deep down that does understand that it's not fair that some people are allowed seemingly to be proud of themselves, to be confident, to be happy, to be unashamed in who they are. And yet I'm not allowed to do that. That shouldn't be the case for anyone. I was listening to a radio show where Henry Rollins was playing jazz and blues. All of a sudden he got super excited because obviously he's got a background in Washington punk rock and he Mm. played Minor Threat's first two EPs just front to back. And I thought to myself, like, what the hell is, can I imagine what other people are thinking of this? You and I know that it's basically our pop music. For us, it's huge. It's For me, it was mm. life-changing to hear Minor Threat and Fugazi. And, but the outside world, you know, air quotes, why is there such a dichotomy between what a parent or an authority figure might mm. think about Minor Threat and what we think about it and how it means such a different thing? Mm. For me, the key is like in the word threat, I think even, you know, I think there's something threatening around the idea of a bunch of people on stage wreaking havoc, standing up the audience. It seems dangerous. It's kind of almost like the early days of rock and roll. For a lot of people, I guess it's scary. It seems too disordered and chaotic. That side of it, I think, would almost distract a certain type of person, I suppose, from the creative energy and the intelligence. Like, I mean, anyone who knows anything, I guess, about Minor Threat would know, like, how intelligent these guys were and Liam McKay and, like, just the ideologies behind this stuff. It wasn't just a lot of people screaming by any means, even though that there's validity in that, of course, you know, the type of therapy. Like, I remember the first time I heard Minor Threat, like, I, even though I'd been into punk, I found Minor Threat almost a bit intimidating. And it was actually kind of this weird situation that my my mother-in-law, who unfortunately passed away about nine years ago, but she and her husband, my father-in-law, they went to Boston, I think, on holiday uh, a few years before she died. And she came back and she had gifts for me and my husband. And she gave me a Minor Threat t-shirt. And I'm very much assuming that this woman who was into the Carpenters and Billie Holiday, she didn't know who Minor Threat were. But she knew I was in music and somehow she found herself in a music store, I guess, in Boston. I had this T-shirt for years and I was always aware that this band existed. So I was wearing the T-shirt because it was very comfortable and I still have it, even though it doesn't fit very well anymore. But when I did actually turn them on for the first time, it was like Betray is the first track on uh, Out of Step. okay, this is different. I never really got into the hardcore stuff until then. And then if I put that alongside like the early New York Doll stuff, I was kind of like, oh God, this is hardcore. <laughs> like it's much more shousy. It's much more aggressive, I suppose. And it took me a few listens to get into it. But when I did, I was like, fuck, this is the shit. How did it change you? It gave me a different layer, I would say, to my punk fandom. Because from... Minor Threat than I got, I've got into, I don't know, because I've been into, into so many, so many different types of music over the years, like I'm a real kind of musical magpie and I listen to like music constantly. So I don't necessarily go through patches of just listening to one type of music for a long time. But certainly when I did get into Minor Threat, it was like a second wave almost, because I had like the particular punk stuff more from the 70s that I've been into for a long time. And then with Minor Threat came bad brains and then I kind of on the other end again bikini kill who become more and more of my favorites kind of like a second blossoming so for me it kind of creates this extra layer um, of misfits um, this extra layer of my sense of punk and that was good it gave it more depth when you were still closeted being a teenager and not feeling yourself not able to present yourself to outside society how you wanted to Mm. Did punk rock 
push you that way? Because you did say it was about a year after. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I, again, I think there was just that sense of, even if I wasn't quite aware of the language on it now at the time, I think now the words I've kind of brainstormed before we started talking, like again, rebellion and revolution, resistance, transgressive, freedom, like, oh my God, like liberty, like all of these things, anyone punk or non-punk who I think has had that experience of being in the closet would have some sense of coming out like it's almost it is like a political act almost like coming out and punk as we know is political it's a statement to stand up and to to fight against a status quo of any kind again the spirit of punk I think that's really when I go back to like the real core spirit of punk around just rebelling and being free to be yourself and everything like I it, it couldn't not have influenced me I just needed kind of time to get to that point where I finally felt okay that this has to change you know but again there was definitely that sense of support again like I always felt like my musical heroes punk or otherwise they were there egging me on towards coming out just knowing that these people existed gave me that kind of sense of just fucking go for it just do it because I didn't have that obviously because I was keeping it a secret I couldn't have that I couldn't have that sense of other people telling me come out it'll be okay not one person in the world knew who I was until I came out to my friend Roisin and uh, and she was so incredibly supportive and then from there all I needed I guess was one person on the outside world to validate that it was okay for me to be gay and then I was able to tell everyone else but before I told her it was these guys and these women from my musical heritage that gave me that sense of encouragement. You talk about on the blog post that I mentioned before, a list of things. Punk challenges you to create something better for yourself. Punk challenges you to get angry, to say no, to have an identity that's against the status quo. That really struck me when I read that list. And I'm wondering how you were feeling when you wrote it. I've always felt like therapy is really creative, but it's also in itself, I think therapy is an act of resistance. To me, it makes perfect sense to put those two together. Like, because if therapy is like revolution and punk is revolution, they have so much in common, like straight off the bat. So why not put them together in a more formalized way? So I think everything in that blog post there was channeling my own sense of punk as this important kind of piece in my journey and this process. And I guess maybe hoping that that could then crystallize into something that other people could understand too so i'm really kind of heartened and, and appreciative to hear you say that you found that blog post you know two and a half years after it was written and it's resonated with you thanks for listening to the latest episode of scream therapy i'm coming to you from pal river a small coastal town in british columbia canada on the traditional territory of the Klohama nation doing this podcast and talking to other folks living with mental health challenges has been a huge part of my journey it means the world to me that you're out there listening You can sign up for my newsletter and find more episodes at ScreamTherapyHQ.com. That's ScreamTherapyHQ.com. I'm looking forward to hearing from you. Let's talk punk and mental health. Thanks again for listening. Until next time, take care and be well.